Hi everybody. So let's list the kings and queens of England and in Great Britain. And we'll start somewhat arbitrarily, but for the sake of time, we'll start with Edward the Confessor. It was Edward's death in January 1066, which led to the crisis that precipitated the Norman invasion and Norman conquest in October 1066. A confessor is a holy person like a saint, but who is not martyred, that is killed for his faith. And indeed, Edward died in his bed he was immediately succeeded by the second most powerful man in England, and that was Harold. Whose father was Earl Godwin of Wessex, so following Scandinavian naming traditions, Harold's surname was Godwinson. Harold claimed that Edward named him successor, uh, but there was another claimant too, and that was William the Bastard, Duke of Normandy, who defeated Harold at the Battle of Hastings in October 1066, and thereafter was known as William the Conqueror. William, after a reign of 20 years, died and was succeeded not by his firstborn son, Robert Curthose, or Short Pants, but rather by his secondborn, who was William Rufus, or William the Red, maybe because he had red hair, maybe because he had a ruddy complexion, we don't know, but it made sense at the time. William was mysteriously killed in a hunting accident, and quickly, perhaps too quickly, claiming the throne was his younger brother, Henry. Who would be Henry the First, also known as Beauclerk. Or the Learned, because he was considered to be an educated man. Henry's first son, William Aetheling, or William the Prince, died off the coast of Harfleur, uh, sailing back to England, and so that was Henry's only legitimate son, and so Henry designated his daughter to succeed him, and that was Matilda. But when Henry died, Matilda was in France and she was pregnant, so she delayed returning to England. And in her absence, the throne was claimed by her cousin who was Stephen of Blois, and Stephen was, in fact, coronated and proclaimed king. 
was a conflict, a civil war, which in British history is referred to as the anarchy. And the essence of it was that Stephen had been a powerful noble, claimed the throne in Matilda's absence. Stephen was popular among the nobles, and the nobles were not willing to accept rule by a woman. However, Stephen began acting perhaps high-handedly, and so support was extended to Matilda, who then, in a battle, actually captured, not personally, Matilda did not personally capture, but her army captured Stephen, and so Matilda was only days away from being crowned Queen of England and the first woman ruler, but According to the sources, Matilda became, uh, well, she started acting like a king, which is to say started acting like a man, which the nobles did not appreciate. They would have liked her to be more womanly, which is to say more submissive in that sensibility of that time. And so indeed, Matilda was not crowned queen, and support went back to Stephen, and there was more than a decade of fighting between forces of Stephen and Matilda. The eventual result was a compromise whereby Stephen would remain queen, excuse me, Stephen would remain king, but when he died, Matilda's son would become the next king of England, and that is in fact what happened. So, in 1154, Matilda's son was crowned. Henry II. Henry II's first son was uh, Henry the Young King, who was actually crowned during the latter part of Henry's reign, but he had no real power, so I won't list him here. Uh, and then he died. And so when Henry died, after a very uh, long rule of um, 35 years, uh, Henry's next eldest son was crowned, and that was the famously named Richard the Lionheart, because of his ferocity and bravery in battle, uh, and he was often away on campaigns. In fact, his rule, his reign, which lasted ten years, Richard was only in England about six months in all that time. So it's an irony that one of the most well-known English kings was indeed more French than English, as many of these early ones were, but uh, Richard was not particularly attracted to England and spent very little time there. But when he died and was killed in a battle, a minor battle with one of his nobles, uh, he was succeeded by his brother, who was the notorious King John, during whose reign the Magna Carta was issued in 1215, which limited the power of the monarchy. And so one of the widely regarded worst kings of England had perhaps the most significant reign, or one of the most significant reigns, in generating that document. I guess we'll put a one there. John does not need to be enumerated because his reign and reputation were such that no subsequent British monarchs uh, have been named John. <laughs>
so. When John died, his son was crowned, and that was Henry III, who was a relatively hapless individual and who was eventually uh, deposed for all intents and purposes uh, in a conflict with the nobles of the land led by Simon de Montfort. But it was during Henry's reign that the first parliament was held. Strictly speaking, it was actually during the rule of Simon de Montfort in 1265, but Henry resumed ruling after that time, um, but it was certainly during this era that the first parliament was convened. And after Henry died, his eldest son was coronated, and that was Edward I, who was also known as Long shanks or long legs because he was tall. And Edward I was a warrior king of the typical medieval type whose campaigns against the Scots earned him the nickname uh, Malleus Scotorum or Hammer of the Scots despite the viciousness and persistence of those campaigns edward never succeeded in subduing scotland or conquering it indeed scotland was never conquered by england and the later union that took place was voluntary and that is a source of continued pride in scotland incidentally for those of you who enjoy these medieval monikers, I should just add that, for example, Henry II uh, also had a nickname, and that was Kurt Mantle, or short coat, because he wore a short coat. Uh, like a cape, but perhaps a little thicker than that. And then John was known in his youth as John Lackland. Why? Because he was the youngest son, in fact, youngest uh, by some interval and his father, Henry, had no land to give to him as an inheritance or as a um, plot of land to rule. And so he was known as Lackland. He eventually became Lord of Ireland and did abysmally there, but uh, John Lackland, uh, his name, um, he certainly earned his name. Well, after Henry I, his son took over, and that was Edward II. Edward II, whose notorious and suspicious relationship with his noble and very close friend Piers Gaveston resulted in a conflict with other nobles who resented Gaveston's closeness to Edward. Some say there was a sexual relationship. We don't know. What is clear is that Edward had an enormous affection for Piers Gaveston 
and indeed Piers Gaveston overshadowed Edward's queen on the very day that they were married. This was Queen Isabella of France. Eventually, Edward was compelled to um, abdicate by forces under the leadership, not the direct leadership, but certainly uh, forces belonging to Queen Isabella herself. And Edward was eventually uh, killed, at least he died, in a castle. There are two stories about how he died. One was that he died of natural causes, and the other is much more vivid and vulgar, which I will not mention, but uh, it was a, a very cruel death. But uh, Edward was nevertheless succeeded by a more striking figure, much more like his grandfather than himself, and that was Edward III, whose claim to the French throne through his mother, Isabella of France, contributed primarily to the Hundred Years' War between England and France. It was actually precipitated really by the King of France attempting to uh, take over English possessions in France but Edward retaliated by asserting his dubious claim to the throne, and that resulted in a war lasting, in fact, about 116 years, and devastated France, enriched England, uh, in which one of the most notable figures is Joan of Arc, uh, who came to prominence much later. She was not around at the time of Edward III. But uh, Edward eventually died uh, without achieving his goals in France, but uh, getting pretty close. But his immediate firstborn son, Edward the Black Prince, died prematurely. Uh, that is to say, he was very young. And so he was succeeded by his grandson, who was Richard II, who as a young boy faced down a class rebellion, which was the so-called Peasants' Rebellion of 1381. It was not really conducted by peasants primarily, but by more what we would consider to be middle-class people. Richard faced them down at the age of 14. But Richard eventually became uh, tyrannical and extremely vain and uh, was eventually, he drove his nobles to the point that they rebelled, not just once, but twice, but the second time, which was in 1399, uh, he disinherited one of the most powerful nobles in England, which was Henry Bolingbroke, the son of the Duke of Lancaster, who was John of Gaunt. Uh, and so Richard's disinheritance of Henry was a pretty big warning sign to other nobles, which was that if Richard could do that to Henry Bolingbroke, he could do it to anyone. And so Henry, uh, who was exiled in France, returned with an army and gained a lot of support. Richard, who was in Ireland at the time of fighting, uh, returned quickly but found that he had zero support. Uh, and ultimately what happened was uh, Henry forced Richard to sign a document abdicating the throne. Uh, the throne was therefore technically vacant, and Henry Bolingbroke claimed it. The claim was granted or acceded to by Parliament, 
and so Henry was coronated uh, and became Henry the Fourth. Uh, it is notable that this was the first coronation in English. Previously, it had been in French. Obviously, uh, at certain points, uh, it was also in Anglo-Saxon or Old English, but since the um, Edward Confessor's time, it had been in French. But now it was in English, and this uh, was a pivotal time for English identity. Well, Henry had a relatively brief and tumultuous rule because he was a usurper. He took the crown from an anointed king, which was very similar to what happened to Edward II, but it was much more direct in this case, meaning um, Simon de Montfort, who essentially deposed Edward II, was not crowned king. Henry IV was. And so if Henry could usurp and take over the crown from Richard, then why couldn't someone else do the same thing to Henry? So Henry, uh, not a very stable or happy rule. But he was succeeded by his son, who was Henry V. Henry V, the great warrior, the victor of Agincourt, and whose uh, missions to France indeed accomplished all that Edward III hoped to. Um, Henry's victories eventually meant that the English controlled more of the territory of France than the French king did. Uh, but, uh, and this was mainly due to an alliance with the Burgundians, the result was that uh, Henry's son would be crowned not just king of England, but also king of France. And indeed, that is exactly what happened so that Henry died at a pretty young age and after not a very long rule, his son Henry the Sixth, who ascended to the throne only as a nine month old child. Uh, but when he was older, he was crowned King of France in Notre Dame Cathedral, uh, and he is certainly the only person who was crowned both King of Great Britain and King of France, but it was not to last. Henry VI was no warrior like his father, Henry V. Henry VI was more interested in doing things like building Eton College rather than retaining the lands that his father had fought so hard to conquer in France. And Henry's weakness, and indeed perhaps his ineffectiveness, led to, or certainly contributed to, the Wars of the Roses, that is the dynastic conflict between the House of Lancaster, represented by the Henrys, and the House of York, which was at the time represented by Richard, Duke of York, who believed that his claim to the throne was greater than Henry VI was. Uh, after many battles uh, and many significant deaths, uh, and one of whom eventually was Henry VI himself, who was uh, put to death on the orders of the new Yorkist king, who was Edward the Fourth, 
who was the son of Richard, Duke of York. Uh, Edward was a, a striking fellow, a tall and apparently attractive, certainly loved uh, hunting and uh, female companionship, but he squandered the opportunity to restore stability to England by uh, doing no less than marrying a woman that he loved. That is, rather than marrying a foreign princess who could add to English power and land, he married one of his subjects, uh, uh, a widow, no less, who had children, but he loved her, and this was Elizabeth Woodville. Uh, and Elizabeth had many brothers, all of whom took continued, or I should say, uh, a great advantage of their sister's uh, role in the realm of England. Uh, the brothers were granted lands and titles and powers, and that caused resentment to the other nobles in the land. In any event, uh, Edward's marriage to Elizabeth Woodville resulted in even more conflict and in fact, Edward was deposed, or uh, maybe deposed isn't the right word, but he was forced into exile, or at least into leaving England for about a year, while Henry VI was restored to his rule. But Edward came back, uh, decisively defeated the Lancastrians again, uh, restored himself to power, but then he died. Um, he had uh, two young boys, and one of those boys, his eldest, was proclaimed Edward V. Edward was in fact proclaimed king, but he was not coronated because prior to his coronation he disappeared. He and his younger brother, the Duke of York, and they were, Edward was about, gosh, I think he was 13 or 14 years old, as I recall. I think that's about right. I think he was 14. But he disappeared, and the most likely scenario is that Edward's uncle, uh, well, what's definitely known is that Edward's uncle, Richard, uh, imprisoned Edward and his brother in the Tower of London and they eventually disappeared and what is believed is that Richard eventually had them murdered. Uh, the reasons for this are a bit more involved than we can go into now, but suffice it to say, Richard believed that the security of England and the security of himself would best be preserved by himself becoming king. And so he did. He was crowned Richard III, whom Shakespeare immortalized as an evil hunchback. Whether he was evil is debatable, but his body was discovered in a parking lot in August 2012. And it was discovered that indeed he did have a hunchback, that is to say a severe case of scoliosis or spinal curvature. Nevertheless, he was a brave, valiant, and successful warrior. He was the last English king to die in battle. And I should say that when he was, dis he was discovered uh, in a parking lot in Leicester, uh, under this marking on the pavement, which surely stood for the word reserved, as in a reserved parking lot, but could it not also have coincidentally stood for Richard or Rex, that is King? Truth is indeed stranger than fiction. Well, Richard was, in fact, 
he lost support once the princes in the tower disappeared. Even though Richard had tried to ingratiate himself to the country, people just couldn't get over the deaths of two innocent boys. That was even uh, frowned upon in so-called brutal medieval times. So Richard lost support, and it was transferred to a uh, Lancastrian who had a tenuous claim to the throne, but he wasn't Richard, and Richard was defeated at the Battle of Bosworth by this man who became Henry the Seventh. And Henry the Seventh's surname was Tudor, one of the more uh, notable or notorious names in British history. Founder Henry the Seventh was founder of a dynasty that would dominate the next hundred and fifteen years, or and slightly more. Well, Henry Tudor was another usurper. Uh, the crown passed many times uh, to different people between Richard II's usurpation in 1399 and Henry VII's accession to the throne in 1487, excuse me, 1483. Uh, but he stayed and uh, fought off all comers and um, became rather more of a kind of a, uh, a tightwad landlord rather than a brilliant king, but he has his defenders. I think we can be sympathetic to Henry Tudor. He did, he was a very nice man apparently, but uh, usurping an anointed king of England really did bring a lot of stress and paranoia into someone's life. Well, when Henry died, his uh, son uh, was coronated, but it was not his eldest son who died as a young boy, uh, but it was in fact his second eldest son, who was Henry VIII, one of the biggest names and biggest people ever to be crowned King of England. He of the six wives um, and the onset of the English Reformation. The story of Henry VIII is pretty well known, so I will not go into too much detail, but for right now, for our purposes, um, after going through a couple wives in the search for a male heir. He finally did have one with Jane Seymour, who died shortly after childbirth. And his son uh, did succeed to the crown upon Henry's death, and this was Edward V. Excuse me, Edward the Sixth. Edward the Sixth was only nine years old at the time he took over, but he was extremely precocious and intelligent, and knew what he was about and what he wanted. It was really under Edward's reign that the English Reformation accelerated and became, to some extent irrevocable. Uh, and so even though he was a, a pretty young man, uh, he was a very effective king, at least in the sense of getting what he wanted. But he died at the age of 15 from an illness, and he had designated a successor and that successor, it was rather an unusual pick, but 
this was, uh, we'll say it was uh, this was Jane Grey, that is Lady Jane Grey, but she was proclaimed Queen of England. She was the daughter of Henry VIII's sister, so she was a cousin of Edward VI, and the reason that Edward designated her his successor was that she was Protestant. She was a fierce Protestant, like Edward was. Uh, more importantly, she was a Protestant while his half-sister, Mary, was a firm Catholic, and Edward wanted a Protestant to succeed him, not the Catholic Mary. Jane Grey did not believe she was entitled to the throne. Uh, and she, in fact, she absolutely thought that Mary was because Mary was considerably older. She was the oldest of Henry VIII's children. And so traditionally, she should have been crowned, even though it would mean the first time the English would be ruled by a woman, but there were no other options. Well, Lady Jane Grey, or Queen Jane, uh, who was again not coronated, nine days after she was proclaimed queen, the forces of Mary uh, defeated the forces of Jane, and so Jane was deposed and imprisoned, uh, and that meant that the new queen, in this case, was Queen Mary. As mentioned, she was a fierce Catholic, and uh, she was highly intelligent and driven much like her father, and she was born prior to Henry's um, change of heart, or at least change of strategy when it came to breaking with the Roman Catholic Church. So she retained her strong Catholicism, uh, even in defiance of her half-brother, Edward VI. Mary earned the nickname Bloody Mary because of her persecution of fierce Protestants, burned them at the stake, about 280 as I recall were burned at the stake. Uh, she had two so-called phantom pregnancies, which is to say she and other people thought she was pregnant, but she was in fact not pregnant. Uh, but she, so she never had children. She had no issue, and therefore when she died uh, at the age of 42, um, she, uh, in a sense, failed at her effort to ensure that England would remain Catholic because after Mary died, the throne belonged to her half-sister, a firm and committed Protestant, Queen Elizabeth. Queen Elizabeth, who ascended to the throne at age 18, and who ruled for 45 years until 1603, and whose era witnessed well, I should say her era, uh, she gave her name to an entire era in European history, the Elizabethan era, uh, an epoch which included Shakespeare and John Donne and the other writers which helped to shape English uh, literature and indeed the English language. Elizabeth I's reign also included the foundation of English settlements in North America, 
not the settlement of Jamestown, which happened later, but the initial settlements in North Carolina by Sir Walter Riley, which were not permanent, uh, but they did happen, 1584 and 1585. And of course, Elizabeth's uh, rule also included the English defeat of the Spanish Armada in 1588. Uh, so it was extremely eventful. Uh, however, she was uh, the Virgin Queen, self-proclaimed, uh, saying to everyone that she was married to her realm. And so when she died in 1603, uh, she had no uh, no child to pass the crown on to, and so it went to her cousin, who was in fact James the Sixth of Scotland, uh, who became James the First of England. And this was James Stuart whose mother was Mary Stuart, or Mary Queen of Scots. Very interesting story between Mary Queen of Scots and Elizabeth, and indeed Elizabeth uh, signed the warrant of execution for Mary Queen of Scots. That is to say, Elizabeth killed James's mother James was the rightful King of Scotland, and he was indeed the uh, next most obvious claimant to the throne of England uh, due to his descent from Edward III. And it was at this time that the crowns of England and Scotland were united. This was not when Great Britain uh, was formed, but it was when the two crowns were united by the person of James I. And James I, a very uh, highly intelligent, um, aggressive, um, well aware of his power and regality, but uh, in many ways a pretty wise and just ruler. It was under him that the King James Bible was executed in 1611, uh, named after King James and also Jamestown, which I just mentioned in Virginia was named after King James as well. Um, Another interesting thing about King James was that he was an opponent of smoking tobacco, which was had just been introduced by the New World, the North and South American colonies of various places like Spain and Portugal. But uh, James actually wrote a book, which the title, as I recall, is First Blast Against Tobacco, he called it a stinking weed and so forth. So James I, uh, ahead of his time uh, in disliking tobacco and indeed attributing uh, health problems to it at the time, many people thought it was actually good for you, but uh, James, he knew better. Well, okay, so James died uh, and was succeeded by his son. Charles I. He was, in fact, not the eldest son of James. He died. The eldest son did. So Charles was the heir after that. And um, among many things one can say about Charles was that inherited from his father was a perspective of the divine right of kings. That is to say that uh, kingship was derived not by the power of man, but by the power of God. And so Charles essentially felt that he was infallible and unquestionable. That attitude conflicted with the prerogatives of Parliament, which resulted in a civil war, uh, which indeed is the English Civil War, 
uh, between the parliamentary and the uh, royal forces, the cavaliers. And the result was, in a nutshell, that Charles lost his head in 1649, not in the sense of losing his senses, but in the sense of having his head chopped off. But he met his fate uh, pretty bravely, uh, it is said. Um, so he at least went out uh, with some dignity. But go out, indeed he did, and he was succeeded not by a king, at least not immediately by a king, but by the Lord Protector, Oliver Cromwell, whom I will not list here because he was not royalty. Uh, after a period of 11 years, the British decided that enough of Lord Protectors, and they would go back to a monarchy, and so this was the restoration and the proclamation of Charles the first son as the new king of England, and that was Charles II. Charles II recognized that his, um, his role was not to be a ruling king, but a reigning king, an important distinction and so he gave the British public pomp and pageantry, a lot of display. He was a bon vivant, a ladies' man who had many illegitimate children, but no legitimate heirs. And so when he died, his brother became the new king of England, and this was... and indeed King of Scotland as well. Uh, this was James II, who was a successful admiral. Uh, James was the Duke of York, and it was James's defeat of the Dutch in New Netherlands and New Amsterdam particularly in North America uh, that that colony was uh, turned over to the British and renamed New York after the Duke of York. Uh, but James was a Catholic in a Protestant country, and his rule was resented by many. And uh, eventually, people tried to dispute that he was even who he said he was. Um, there were stories about him being switched at birth and so forth. It was very strange. But the result was that James was ousted from power and fled into exile, uh, chased away by the people of uh, what would soon be called Great Britain. And uh, this was the Glorious Revolution of 1688. And Parliament invited William of Orange of the Netherlands to become king, which he did. Uh, but in fact, uh, his wife uh, was Mary, who was the daughter of James. And the uh, successors, therefore, of James II was uh, a king and a queen. And this was William and Mary, and the distinction here is important. Uh, we do not list the wives of Charles I or James I or any of these because they were consorts. They, of course, had the title of queen, but they had no power. Mary was the daughter of James II. She was a rightful queen of England uh, and Scotland and Ireland and so she had co-equal authority to William whose claim to the throne was uh, much more distant than Mary's uh, 
and so uh, we and this I should say is uh, William the third and uh, I suppose then this would be Mary the uh, second I'm not sure I've ever seen her referred to as Mary the second but she is technically so this was a co-regency of William and Mary she was not just a, uh, a consort of the monarch, but a monarch in her own right. Well, they uh, gave the people what they wanted, uh, which was effective, uh, yet not invasive royalty. And William was free to carry off his favorite, uh, carry on, I should say, his favorite activity, which was making war against Louis XIV in France. And uh, this he did with great vigor and persistence at William and Mary College in Virginia, which uh, is the third oldest college in the US, is of course named after them, not just a coincidence. Well, they died without legitimate issue. And so the throne passed to uh, Mary's sister, another daughter of James II. And this was Queen Anne. In 1707, during Queen Anne's reign, the Act of Union was promulgated, and that officially transformed England and Scotland into Great Britain. Uh, she also uh, made war against Louis XIV, uh, inheriting that propensity from uh, her brother-in-law. Uh, but she also had no children. And so when she died, the throne went next to an unexpected place, a German. The closest claimants to the throne were all Catholic and so the next person in line to the throne with a legitimate claim but who was also Protestant because by this time the law was that the monarch had to be Protestant so the next legitimate claimant who was a Protestant was the elector of the state of Hanover the Germanic state of Hanover, and this was uh, George the First. Did not speak a word of English, uh, rather enjoyed his palace in Hanover, but was certainly happy to accept the invitation to become King of Great Britain. Why not? Well, he did that, uh, and uh, after uh, a pretty brief, uh, something like 20-year reign, uh, in which there were several minor conflicts with the French and um, all the rest of the uh, European conflict that was occurring in this pre-Enlightenment time, uh, he died, and his son, with whom he had a tumultuous relationship, became the new king. George II, who spoke a little more English. Well, George II also did not have a particularly long reign. Uh, and his firstborn, with whom he also had a uh, dramatic and contentious relationship, his firstborn died. And so when George II eventually passed away, he was succeeded by his grandson, who was this man. George III, who had a remarkably long rule. He uh, came to the throne in 1760 and did not die until 1821. 
but for the latter uh, decade or so of his life, he was essentially incapacitated. George III uh, suffered from an illness called porphyria, an inherited illness, one of whose symptoms is uh, mental illness. Um, and George uh, was essentially mad, so to speak, in his remaining years. Uh, notably, George III's reign included the French and Indian War, which was the uh, name for the War of Spanish Succession, uh, the Seven Years' War, it's sometimes called. Uh, in the New World, North America, it was the French and Indian War. Uh, but George III's reign also witnessed the American Revolution, which commenced in 1775 and ended in 1783. Of course, famously, George III is blamed for every single problem in the American colonies by the Declaration of Independence, but in fact, uh, he knew, and everyone else knew, and the Americans knew, that George III did not set policy. Parliament did, but it was easier to blame one man, the king, than to blame the members of Parliament. Uh, does not sound as compelling. Uh, but George III was, in fact, a good man, a decent man, a humane man, um, who did not wish any cruelty or harm on the Americans. He was by no means a tyrant. Uh, and his reign also presided over the uh, French Revolution, too. So uh, the Battle of Waterloo, for example. So uh, many, many, many significant events occurred in the 60 years that he was king. But when he eventually succumbed, uh, his son took over who was yet another George. George IV, who was extremely ostentatious and had a dazzling coronation ceremony uh, and whose uh, corpulence and showiness was made fun of in the popular press with cartoons, which are very funny, I must say, the depictions of George IV, uh, a tradition of mocking politicians that has not left the British press and which uh, Americans have certainly inherited too, among other places for sure. Uh, but George IV uh, did not have any legitimate issue and so when he died, he was succeeded by his brother, who was William IV. William was a successful admiral, like James II before him and whose reign was not particularly long, but it included some significant uh, events, most notably the Reform Act of 1832, which extended the suffrage and which expanded representation in Parliament. Uh, William cannot take credit for that necessarily, but uh, he was there and presided, and that's uh, uh, a flavor of what was going on that time during William's rule, or more accurately, his reign. Well, when William died, without legitimate issue, uh, the next in line to the throne was a young woman, uh, his niece, who was and became uh, Queen Victoria. Like Queen Elizabeth, Queen Victoria gave her name to an entire era, specifically in this case, most of the 19th century. Victorian era really is uh, 
stands for um, a kind of co uh, conservatism, uh, sexual prudishness, um, long clothing for men and women, more importantly for women. Also, a lot of sentimentality. But Victoria herself was a very warm and loving person who wanted to raise her family like a normal family, who was uh, devoted to her husband, Prince Albert, and who was devastated when Prince Albert died as a young man in his 40s in 1861. And she wore black during the remaining 40 years of her widowhood, never wore any other color, and secluded herself for quite some time after his death. But uh, it was under Queen Victoria that the British Empire expanded rapidly and became the empire uh, on whose borders the sun never sets. Uh, Queen Victoria's daughter married the Kaiser in Germany, and Germany at this time was the Empire of Germany, and so Victoria's daughter was the Empress of Germany. The story goes that uh, Queen Victoria was a bit envious that her daughter was an Empress while she was only a Queen, and so she instructed her Prime Minister to basically fix that, and indeed uh, Victoria became Empress of India. India, of course, had been within British control for more than a hundred years. I shouldn't say more than uh, since the 1780s, so uh, almost a century. But uh, Victoria became uh, Queen of the British Isles of Ireland, etc., uh, etc., et including Empress of India, the crown jewel or I should say the jewel in the uh, crown of England. Uh, Victoria eventually passed away at the age of 82 uh, in 1901. So she lived into the 20th century. Remarkably, she's actually on film. Uh, during the Diamond Jubilee, her 75th, or not 75th, this would have been her 60th year on the throne in 1897. Uh, she was, uh, there is not video, but there is film of her uh, in the parade. You can barely make her out wearing black, kind of looking like a blob. The film, of course, very old, it's indistinct, but uh, she lived a woman born in 1819, lived long enough to be on video. Um, you know, again, I think that's pretty striking. Well, okay, so Victoria's eldest son took over, and this was the Prince of Wales, of course, um, and that was Edward the Seventh who was a playboy, a fun-loving guy, friendly, gregarious, uh, and his parents thought uh, did not take anything seriously. Uh, they thought he was lazy, not very committed, and would be an embarrassment to the British Empire should he become king. But in fact, uh, when he eventually was crowned, he rose to the occasion and he uh, was a good king in the sense of reigning with dignity and with pride. Uh, he took many tours around the British Empire, or at least in the British Isles. He had visited abroad. Uh, as the Prince of Wales, but while he was king, he he was seen. He made himself visible. He often wore uh, one of the uh, primary crowns, 
of England uh, when he went around to show people his regality, not because he had an excessive sense of self-pride, but because he realized that one of the functions of the monarchy at this time was to um, be symbolic of the British people, to um, demonstrate the power and the pageantry of the monarchy and metaphorically of the British Empire itself. Edward also gave his name to an era. This time, uh, the early 20th century, was the Edwardian period, known for ostentation and um, very um, trendy and stylish fashion and gaudiness. Uh, if you think of a Victorian I shouldn't say Victorian, but if you think of an early 20th century interior furnishing with overstuffed chairs and uh, gilt furnishings and enormous chandeliers uh, and everything being green and white, these are the hallmarks of the Edwardian period. Well, Edward died and was succeeded by his son, uh, Edward VI. No, not Edward VI. This would be, um, I'm sorry. This is George the Fifth. Okay. Uh, George the Fifth uh, was uh, king of Great Britain during the uh, Great War, World War I. And again, at this time, kings did not directly rule so much as reign, but he had a fairly long reign and uh, a successful one. Um, the most important, of course, part being uh, his, uh, uh, his being at the head of the British people during World War I, in which uh, Great Britain lost more people than it lost even in World War II. In fact, that's also true of Italy and France. Great Britain, Italy, and Fra France suffered more casualties in the First World War than they did the Second World War. So it was a huge impact, both in the population and in uh, economically. George cannot get any credit for guiding the British people through that, except he was an important symbol of stability and national pride, which uh, a function he served very well. Well, when George V died, uh, his son took over. And this was Edward VIII. Well, Edward VIII always knew he was going to be king. He was the firstborn of George VI. But there was an issue, and the issue was that Edward VIII fell in love with a woman who was an American divorcee. Uh, and this was Wallace Simpson. And the problem was that it was simply unacceptable for Edward VIII to marry Wallace Simpson and to have the royal consort be a divorced woman. Uh, Edward was not prepared or willing to uh, set a precedent on that account. He felt that he did not have enough popular support. So Edward had a choice, Wallace Simpson or the crown of Great Britain. Well, he chose Wallace Simpson. And so uh, he abdicated after, I should say, two years on the throne. This was in 1937 that he abdicated. Obviously very shocking to people that someone could choose the love of a woman or a partner in this case, of course, a woman, but someone could choose love 
over one of the most prestigious jobs, if you will, in the entire world. But Edward did that. Uh, and uh, that is something that uh, uh, hopefully he did not guilt trip Wallace Simpson for uh, during the remainder of his life. Like, don't get into an argument with me. I gave up being king of Great Britain for you, so no, I'm not going to cut the grass today. Something like that. Edward, unfortunately, also had an unsavory aspect, and this was his admiration of Nazi Germany, and specifically the person of Adolf Hitler. Edward VIII was not a Nazi, nor, I think, even a Nazi sympathizer, uh, in the sense that he certainly didn't want Nazis to win World War II, but his... Uh, Ad, not his advocacy, but his um, approval of Nazi Germany was uh, a bit more excessive than perhaps was appropriate. This was, of course, prior to knowing about the Holocaust or even World War II itself. This would have been prior to that, during Hitler's ascendancy and consolidation of power. But nevertheless, uh, Edward is sort of uh, uh, given a black mark in history by his his uh, willingness to look on the bright side when it came to Nazi Germany. Well, so Edward advocate, excuse me, abdicated, and uh, his uh, brother took over, who never expected to be king, and this was. George VI. Uh, George VI uh, was pretty surprised to become king of Great Britain. Uh, and I should uh, say that one of the more uh, impressive stories about George VI was that during the Blitz, that is the Nazi bombing of Great Britain during 1940 and into 1941, uh, George and his wife, Queen Mary, were encouraged to leave the country, to go to Canada, to escape harm's way. But they decided they would not do that. They would stay and suffer with their people to the same extent that was practicable. And uh, this was a huge morale booster for the people of Great Britain to have their sovereign stay with them during that uh, very trying time. I'm sure that they would have understood if they had left, because you don't want Nazi bombs killing the king and queen, one or the other, of Great Britain, but that would have been a huge propaganda victory, obviously. But they stayed, and they made themselves visible during the Blitz, just like Churchill did, and they uh, acted bravely and boldly, and I think with a lot of class, by making sure that their people understood that they were with them, they were not going to abandon them, uh, and that symbolized the power and the strength of Great Britain and uh, their uh, courage I think was emblematic of uh, the courage of the British people during that time. Not that they were the only people who exhibited courage during World War II, but in the context of what we're doing here. Well, George VI passed away in 1953, and his eldest daughter became the new monarch. And this was the current occupant of the throne, Elizabeth II uh, of the House of Windsor. And Elizabeth's reign 
uh, has been since 1953. She was coronated in 1954, the first coronation to be broadcast on television to an audience of millions. Uh, she was quite young at the time, uh, 18 years old, same as Elizabeth I. Uh, and uh, she uh, has now reigned for, uh, well, 63 years. Um, and that is the longest that any British monarch has reigned. And also Elizabeth is the longest lived monarch of England or Great Britain. She is 90 years old. Uh, her consort, Prince Philip, uh, Duke of Buckingham, is 92 or 93. I cannot remember which. I don't think he's 94. He's in his early 90s. Uh, but they are in good health and uh, still getting about. Uh, Elizabeth and Philip's son, uh, Prince Charles has the dubious, perhaps dubious, distinction of being the longest waiting heir apparent. That is, no one else has waited so long to be coronated as Prince Charles, but I'm sure he does not mind because in order for him to become king, uh, that can only happen as a consequence of the death of his mom. And so uh, we can't blame him for not wanting to rush that. Uh, Elizabeth's reign obviously has witnessed many, many events as any period exceeding 50 or 60 years would. Uh, but it is notable that uh, when she was crowned in 1954, uh, the United States itself was only 180 years old uh, and that uh, President Eisenhower was in office. Uh, the French still controlled Southeast Asia. China had only just become communist a few years earlier. Uh, there was no space travel of any kind. The first satellite had not been launched. So, point being, there's a world of difference between when she ascended to the throne and the current state of the world. Uh, but there are many heirs to follow. Elizabeth II, Prince Charles, and then his son, and then his son. Uh, so there are uh, many more people who are stand ready to occupy the throne of Great Britain. Uh, and uh, should the British people wish to retain the monarchy, uh, they will have people to do so. And if Scotland chooses to remain part of Great Britain, then there will be a Great Britain. Uh, uh, otherwise, uh, the United Kingdom as such will not exist, but it will be England and Northern Ireland and Wales uh, as other member and other members of the Commonwealth, but many questions ahead. But uh, as long as the people see value in the monarchy, it will persist. Well, so that is our list of the kings and queens of England and Great Britain. And uh, about a thousand years of history and I hope you enjoyed that. I certainly thank you for watching and see you next time.